old is, is not going to be on today, so make sure you have your Bibles ready to, uh, to read along. Um, all of our announcements are usually on the screen, so um, if you want to know what's going on in the church, come see me after the service. <laughs> or, or watch the screen back there. Yeah, just watch back there and watch. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Warsaw Baptist Church. My name's Ken. I'm one of the pastors here. And can I have my mic down just a little bit? Um, we, are, we are here today to worship uh, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, as we come together to worship at Warsaw Baptist Church, we worship in three primary ways, in our giving, in our singing, and in the preaching and hearing of God's Word. Um, if you're here and you're a visitor or a guest, uh, please don't worry about the first part of that worship. Uh, giving is just what we do as a family. If you are a, a member or longtime visitor, it's what we do to keep the uh, ministry going here. But uh, we will be singing in just a moment, and uh, before we do that, we have quite a few prayer requests. I was, I was telling some people that um, as I was writing them all down for this morning, more kept coming in, so I had to, you know, just keep making new pages. Um, so if you could uh, just listen real close to these prayer requests so that you know who needs prayer. Um, if, you, uh, if you miss any of them, if you're writing them down or something, um, it'll be on the recording so you can watch it later on. Um, but uh, but let's pray for uh, one of my best friends, Ted Lapine, who lives in Cincinnati. He's got a lung disease that is basically just causing his lungs to harden 
um, and the only thing they can do is do a transplant and um, they, he's on palliative care now and it's gonna be at least six months for a transplant at OSU. So be in prayer for him, his name's Ted. Uh, be in prayer for Terry Hinman. Uh, he has colon cancer, he works over at NASS um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's really severe. So be praying for Terry. Uh, pray for Tracy's Aunt Rita uh, who's dealing with kidney stones and blood clots. Um, just got that one in this morning. Um, COVID-19, uh, it is just sweeping across the county right now. Um, the pastor, Andy from Sparta Baptist, said that he said 95% of them have it. So I don't know if he was just saying a majority or if, or if it's actually 95%, but a lot of them have it. Um, I know it's spreading through uh, many of the factories here. Uh, Tim Browning over at Sparta Baptist, he's been in and out of the hospital. I think he had a temperature of 105 yesterday. Um, Nick uh, Hamill, who is uh, Chase's age, right? Um, he's, he's in the hospital right now with it. Um, Logan Ruth, uh, Nicole Ruth's son, uh, he's got it. And his girlfriend, Alexis, has it. Uh, Diana Riley has it. Um, she's, she's got COVID and pneumonia, if I, if I remember right. So um, it, is, it is just kind of everywhere right now. So, so please be careful with that. Um, we want to pray for everyone in Afghanistan. Uh, we want to pray for uh, the soldiers who, who are, you know, who have served there and, and who have just recently been pulled out of there. We want to pray for all of the people who were allies with us who are now under the gun uh, and stuck in there. Uh, there's still Americans over there um, in, in the country um, and, and the, the Christian church obviously uh, is, is under fire as well. So please be in prayer for everything related to Afghanistan. Be in prayer for Tennessee. Um, I just saw on the news that they've got at least eight people killed and dozens missing from flash floods overnight. Um, so be in prayer for them. Uh, mostly, of course, we want to uh, come together in holy boldness and humble sorrow and just ask God to save those who are lost. Um, there, are, there are people that we know and love in our families, in our community. Uh, there are people in our, our government, government structures. There's people in our military and law enforcement, uh, people we know and love and uh, who, who don't know and love Jesus. And we want to pray for them most of all. Um, so if you could join me in prayer, then we'll get started. Father God, I love you so much. And... Lord, the weight of, of this flood of, of prayer requests uh, is, is not light. But you've, you've told us that we are to cast our anxieties onto you. You've told us that we are to take all of our burdens and bring them to you. And that's what we're doing today collectively as the church. We are coming to you and we're saying, help us. And Lord, we're coming to you and we're, we're saying thank you for all that you've already done to help us. And Lord, we are coming to get to today and, and agreeing together that our heart goes even deepest toward those who we love and know who do not love and know you. Lord, I pray that, that even today you would work in their lives, that you would put us and other people in their lives who, who know and will share the gospel uh, so that they can have their greatest problem in life dealt with. Lord, we thank you so much for saving us out of so many different kinds of sin. We thank you for joining us together by the power of your spirit and the truth of your word. Lord, we, we ask that now as we come together to praise you, to sing to you, that you would uh, push away all the distractions and all the cares and all the concerns that would, that would interrupt our communion with you, Lord. So, Lord, as we, as we now sing, as we uh, come together with our voices, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified, magnified in it. And, Lord, I pray that today... If there's someone in this room or someone watching from home who does not yet know you, I pray that you would tackle their hearts and bring them close to you. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' perfect and precious name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, let's sing. Good morning. Good morning. You stand with us as we praise.
it looks like I still don't have a screen, so. so sing along if you know it. If you don't, it's all good. Because I don't even know it. I got the words in front of me.
doing without the screen. <laughs> Got a small one back there if you want to turn around.
right. For those of you that I could hear, you were doing fine without the screen. Uh, if you are uh, new here, uh, we usually have the words from the Bible that I'm preaching from on the screen. Uh, we don't have that today, so if you don't own a Bible, there should be a hardback blue one near you in the pew. Go ahead and grab that. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 106 once we pray for the kids, uh, and then we're going to dig in. So, Father God, thank you for the children of this church. Thank you that you continue to bring more and more here. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with the nursery workers and the children's church workers. Lord, please help them to uh, just love these children well and send them back into their homes ready to be discipled by their parents and grandparents and caretakers. Lord, help us to do our part and help us to train the parents to do their part. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Kids, you can be dismissed. Candace, do you need an extra hand in nursery today? Okay, okay. <laughs> the beautiful thing is we just have more and more kids to bring into the nursery. If you are a parent, a longtime member or visitor of the church, please consider volunteering for nursery and kids' church. I know the, the Hoppertons are always looking for, for new volunteers, so if you're wanting to do that, Talk to Brad or Jenny after the service. Um, we do need to just get a background check for you. Um, one thing that I forgot to pray about at the beginning was uh, the schools are starting back this week, right? Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, that we have a room full of educators and staff and faculty, parents and students. Um, we are praying for all of you, whether you're going to a public school or a private school or you're homeschooling. Uh, we, we are praying for you, and uh, uh, we know that you all need the Lord's help for, for all, of, all of what you're about to uh, go through. So uh, open up your Bibles to Psalm 106, and like I said, if you don't have a Bible, please find one and open it, because I want your nose in the text, all right? As we're going through, there is so much here. Um, uh, it's actually probably easier for whoever's upstairs, Josh or Caitlin, I can't see. Um, but uh, I have a ton of text to go through today, so they were going to be switching back and forth, so uh, it'll be a little easier for them. Um, Psalm 106, once you're there in your Bible, go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's Word. And there are 48 verses to this uh, psalm. Uh, one of my pastor friends knew that I was preaching 106 today, and he said, you know, that's about a minute per, per verse, right? And I said, well, we'll see. Um, it is 48 verses. I'm going to read all 48 verses, and that might be a lot of standing. If you are with child or in, other, in some other way unable to stand for that whole time, then you have a grace pass. Everybody else, i got to stand for an hour. You can do this for five minutes. All right. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, so that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but they rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his namesake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry, and led them through the deep as through a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe, and redeemed them from the power of the enemies. And the waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. Verse 13, but they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked, but sent a wasting disease among them. 
When men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the company of Abram. Fire also broke out on, on, in their company. The flame burned up the wicked. Then it says in verse 19, they made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Then they despised the pleasant land, having no faith in his promise. They murmured in their tents, and they did not obey the voice of the Lord. Therefore he raised his hand and swore to them that he would make them fall in the wilderness and would make their offspring fall among the nations, scattering them among the lands. Then they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor, and they ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds, and a plague broke out among them. Then Phinehas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stayed, and that was counted to him as righteousness from generation to generation forever. Then they angered him at the waters of Meribah, and, went, and it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord had commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus they became unclean by their acts. They played the whore in their deeds. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nation, so that those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their power. Verse 43 says, many times he delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant. He relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. Save us, O Lord, our God, and gather us among the nation, from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Verse 48, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, amen. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Father God, as we unpack your word now, as we dive in, I pray that you would just just get me out of the way and just connect my words, the words in your book to the hearts of everyone who hears the sound of my voice. Lord, I do not doubt that we came in here with so many different concerns and cares that I could not possibly speak to every one of them, but I believe that your spirit can speak to each of us right here, right now. Lord, we trust that, we plead for that, and we now sit humbly in submission to what you would have us know. It's in Jesus' perfect and precious name that all God's people said, amen. You can have a seat. Thank you for standing that long. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallel is praise. Yah is short for Yahweh. It is hallelujah, praise the Lord. This is how this psalm begins, and this is how the psalm ends. Verse 1, praise the Lord. That is hallelujah. Verse 48, at the very end, let all the people say amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. That's how this psalmist decided he wanted to open and close this piece of work. This is a psalm where 38 of the 48 verses 
are recounting how messed up we are as God's people. If you were, if you were to write a psalm like this, if you were to just say, okay, I'm going to write about not anything that we've done good, but everything that we've messed up as the church in the last 800 years, because that's about the time frame that this covers. Would you think, okay, the way I want to start and end that little poem is with praise the Lord? If you were to just write a psalm about how you as a Christian, have messed up your life, have gone against God's will, gone against his design, sinned, would you, would you bookend that poem with praise the Lord? I don't think I, I would just by instinct start there and end there. See, when, when we read the, the scriptures, we want to actually read it, digest it, study it. Don't just look at the words and, and read them with no emotion. Don't just read them and to say that you've read them and then move on to the next chapter. Read it and study it and say, okay, why in the world would the Holy Spirit have inspired that writer to begin and end such a really heavy mournful, look how bad we are type of psalm with praise the Lord, with hallelujah. It's an interesting point to me. I don't know if it is to you. Psalm 105, the psalm right before this, we, we stopped the psalm series in March, so you might not remember it. But Psalm 105, an equally long psalm, also covers a large amount of the history of Israel, but it is a whole different feel. Like if you read 105 today, and then read 106 again, you'll be like, wow, this, this almost sounds like two different histories. And, and some people might think, well, okay, 105 is a whitewashed history where it's just all the good stuff, none of the bad stuff. And then this one is history warts and all, stains and all. But that's not exactly what it is. See, every part of the Bible is written for a reason. Every verse, every word, every chapter, every book, each testament, the whole thing is written for a reason. And Psalm 105 was written, written for the reason of emphasizing God's might and power. Sometimes we need to just meditate on his might and power. Sometimes we can be so overtaken by all the things that are wrong in our world, all the things that are wrong in our lives, all the things that are wrong in our relationships, all the things that are wrong with our health, and we need to focus and meditate on the fact that he's bigger than all of that. He's, he's got that under control. That's what Psalm 105 was for, but Psalm 106 is a history compiled to highlight his steadfast love. And again, you might read it and say, well, that's not the first thing that jumps out at me. The first thing that jumps out at me is 38 of the 48 verses being we are terrible and here's why. But the reason he shows the, the Holy Spirit in, in, enlivened and in, in inspired this writer to write this way was so he could say, yes, you cannot understand God's steadfast love and mercy if you don't understand how bad we are and how much we need it, right? When, when, when Job was walking on earth, Satan said to God, well, of course he loves you. You've given him everything. It'd be easy for us to say we love God and he should love us if we're like the poster child for what Christian life should be, right? But how many of us can actually raise our hand and say, you know what, be a Christian like me. I'm putting my arm down real quick. The truth of how screwed up we are, the truth of how messed up we continue to be is what highlights what makes the, the mercy and the steadfast love of God shine. And the reason I, I want to just focus on the steadfast love is because it's mentioned three times in this uh, psalm, and I think it gives us a template to sum up the whole thing. 
The first thing we see about his steadfast love is that we should be praising it. So look at chapter uh, 106, verse 1 again. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love endures forever. That's, that's the good part. That's what we should praise. But we also see in this, in this psalm that the problem, the problem with believers, the problem with Israel, the problem with the church, the problem with us Christians here in this room is we forget about the steadfast love. So we should praise it, but we forget it. If you look at verse 7, you'll see that. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but they rebelled by the sea, at the Red Sea. So we've got a thing to praise, God's steadfast love. All of the problems that you read in this psalm stem from we forgot about God's steadfast love. And then there's a pardon that is given to us, and it's because of, you guessed it, his steadfast love. If, if you jump over to verse 45, it's right near the end. Just going to pause. I love that sound. Um, I, I, on my, it just has nothing to do with this, but um, on my computer, I have... I have white noise on my computer, like YouTube videos of, of coffee shops and cityscapes, because I just need noise when I'm working. I would love if somebody would just record just pages flapping. That would be fantastic. I love that sound. Anyway, the pardon that we get to deal with the problem of us forgetting to praise is all wrapped up in the same thing. Verse 45, for their sake he remembered his covenant. And he relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. That's where we're going to, that's going to be kind of the roadmap for where we go in the psalm today, okay? We're not going to cover every single verse. Somebody say it, says, it, says amen. All right. I know some of you are saying it in your, under your breath anyway. So we can just acknowledge it's a lot to, to take, but... Let's first look at the praise. We are to praise the God of steadfast love. Look again at verse 1. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures how long? Forever. The first thing we see in that verse is that he is good. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. In fact, if you want to see a definition for good, you look to God. And, and, and everything that is good in your life is supposed to point to the goodness of God. If you love to eat, God says, I am the bread of life. That good gift that I gave you of food, it points to me. If you're thirsty, he says, I am the one who's going to give you rivers of living water. That thirst was to point to him. When you feel like your world will be complete when you can just lay your head back down on your pillow and go to sleep and hit the snooze a couple more times, that rest that is so good is a pointer to Jesus who gives us our final complete rest. He is our Sabbath rest. Your need for companionship that good feeling when you see that loved one that you haven't seen for so long and you, and you get to embrace and you get to, 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 to talk about old times, and you, that companionship, that, that is a pointer to Jesus who is a friend to sinners like us. Who despite all that we do, when he sees us, he says, come, come on. I've waited so long to see you again. He is gentle and lowly in heart. He wants us to come to him. Everything that is good in your life is designed by God to point to God. Amen? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love is steadfast. So I've said that several times already this morning. Steadfast means it is unshakable. Uh, Jesus says uh, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that, that if you want to make it through this life, you need to build 
on the foundation of his teaching. Take what I say and do it. And when, not if, when the storms come, the waves crash, the wind beats against your house, you'll be fine if you're built on that foundation. That foundation is Christ himself. And listen, a majority of the storms that have come into my life that have almost knocked me over are not out there storms. It's in here storms. Anybody else? The majority of the storms that, that I battle are storms of my own making. Choices that I made without thinking through to the consequence. Things that I said that I should have just, oh, oh, just one more second, bite your tongue, and then all that problem's not there. The storms are my own making. But there's also other storms that hit us, right? Loved ones betray us or, or die. Governments lose their mind if they ever have it. There's wars and rumors of wars. There are storms, but the one thing in our life that is steadfast, the one thing that is unshakable, is not just God himself, but God's love for you. God's love for you will not shake, will not waver, even when you sin against him. This psalm recounts 800 years of sin against God, and yet when they cried out to him, his steadfast love was right there. There is no one in this room who has sinned, out, sinned their way out of his love. No one. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've thought, no matter when you did it, whether that's sins that you committed 20 years ago or 20 minutes before you came in here, you are loved by this God. Praise this God who has unshakable love. And, and also, look at this again. His steadfast love endures forever. His love is a forever love. Like, just try to wrap your mind around it. Some of you are, are, are older. Some of you can look back and say, man, it's been a long time. I, have, I've, I've, I think I've ran the race and I've finished. I'm ready to go see the Lord. I have that conversation with a lot of people when they're older. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm done. I've been through it. When we look over our lives, some of you are young and you're looking forward and you're saying, oh my goodness, I got another 40 years of this, right? Or longer. Think about eternity. Think about not 40 years from now, but 40,000 years from now. In 40,000 years, his steadfast love will still be enduring. In 40,000 years, his steadfast love, his commitment to your betterment will, will not waver. And you and I will not get bored of that love. Some of you are like, 40,000 years. Doesn't that get old? No. For 40,000 years, he will continue to be committed to your betterment. And on the other side of this, his commitment to our betterment will not be hindered by our own sin or the sins that are done against us. It only gets better and better forever. Can you imagine that? I can't. Like when I think of eternity, my brain just hurts. But it's good to remind ourselves that this, 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 this promise of God is a promise that the best is always yet to come if you're a believer. Always. The best day you have here on earth, better's coming. The worst day you're having, better's coming. We just have to hold on to this one who loves us with an unshakable forever love. If you look at verse 2, it says, Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? The reasons for praising God are inexhaustible. I mean, we all have our top ten list, right? I'm so glad he saved me. 
I'm so glad he saved the ones in my family and friends that he saved. I'm so glad I have decent health, better health than I've had in other parts of my life, better health than some other people have, whatever. We're thankful for, you know, material possessions. We're thankful for those things. But, but this says, who can utter, who can say all the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all of his praise? You cannot possibly meditate long enough to, to think on every single blessing. You can't. When you think you have thanked him for everything, the Holy Spirit sometimes says, you forgot about this. I remember that. It's amazing. You cannot exhaust the praise due to his name. If you're here and you're saying, I've never really felt blessed by God. Listen, the fact that you're breathing is testimony that he's pouring out grace. There is common grace to everyone, whether you're a believer or not. Rain and sun come to us all. But you have the opportunity to embrace so much more than just the general grace. You have such an an amazing opportunity to embrace all that he has to give you. But then also look at verse 3. When we observe and, and, and do what we can to declare and utter all of his mighty deeds and praise, as we, as we just focus on doing that, instead of focusing on uttering all the things that are wrong in our life, all the things that are wrong in the world, as we utter those things, as we do that, blessed are those who observe his justice and who do righteousness at all time. When we observe and declare it, it transforms us. If you, if you have been a Christian for a long time and you feel like, man, I'm still immature. I would ask lovingly, because that's who I am. I would lovingly say, what are you declaring? What are you dwelling upon? What are you thinking on and telling other people about? If it is all the concerns and cares and problems of this world and never about the God who is fixing it all, who is making all of the broken things untrue, if, if you're not focused on that, you are shooting yourself in the foot when it comes to growing as a Christian. This transforms us. This blesses us. Also, look at verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them. When we have an attitude of, of, of praise, when we are, are, are leaning into God, when we're saying, okay, you are awesome, I'm not, but save me, then you, in that act of repenting and believing in his goodness, you're a given community. If you are, if you're like me, I, I used to, I used to, like be able to hang out in crowds and seem like I was loving it. But with all the people around me, I still felt completely alone my whole life. But as we together humbly say, I messed up, but he's incredible, that ties us together. If we were just to go through this room and say, okay, now tell me your story, tell me your story, tell me your story, you'd find out that our stories are incredibly different. If I, if I went around the room and said, okay, tell me, what side of the political aisle are you on? And I'm not going to. You'd find out that you're sitting in a room with a bunch of people who disagree with you. If I asked about your opinion on the vaccine... You've got a bunch of people who disagree with you in this room. And I know what you're thinking. They're wrong. You're right. But we're all together. That's the point. The gospel brings all kinds of people together. The only thing you need to join this community is an acknowledgement that you're broken and that he is not. That you're broken and you need him to restore you. If you're there, bless you. If you're there, you're in. There's no secret handshake. We do dunk you in some water. 
but you're in. Praising his steadfast love gives us community. But there's this problem. The problem is they, the Israelites that we read about in the Old Testament, and we, the church, and I, an individual Christian, and you, if you're a Christian, as an individual Christian, we forget his steadfast love. And you might say, how in the world is it possible that they forgot it? Like, if you know the story of Exodus, he sent all these plagues to destroy the, 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 the false god worship in Egypt. He killed the firstborn of every family in Egypt except for the Israelites. He took them to the Red Sea. He split the Red Sea. They walked through it like it was the desert. And over and over and over, not like thousands of years later, like three days later, they're saying, did he just bring us out here to kill us? Remember, remember how nice it was in Egypt? We had, we had all the food we wanted. You were enslaved, right? We forget his steadfast love. And, and the reason this happens is because first, before we forget outright, we, we just get distracted by other things. If you look again at verse 7, it says, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. Before they forgot, they just stopped considering God. And I know that as soon as some of you leave here, your phone will be turned back on and there will be 10 messages telling you, think about all these things instead, right? I know that, I know that as soon as you leave here and you turn on your radio, somebody will tell you, these are the things that you need to be concerned with. Some of you, even while you're sitting here, are thinking about this shopping list or this, you know, grudge list or whatever it is, and you can't just keep your mind on God and consider God. And when we stop considering God, whether that's because of, of sin or, or because of, of, of envy or anger or just just the senses that we want to satisfy, my taste buds, whatever else. When we stop thinking on God, we, we quickly get glory amnesia. And you've known people like this if you've been a Christian for more than a week. People who, who sing along with you in a room like this and then as soon as they leave here, they start swearing about their boss or their relatives or their phones. We get glory amnesia. And glory amnesia, this, this forgetting the steadfast love of God is the root of all kinds of evil and wickedness that you see in this song. And I don't have time to unpack it all, but let me look at just a couple of them. Do you know what the first and second commandments are? Of the Ten Commandments? Anybody? Anybody? Have no other guys before me and? Don't make any graven images, right? All right, so from now on, I think we're going to read the Ten Commandments when we start. Don't have any gods before me. And don't make any graven images. Look at what they did. Verses 19 through 22 says this. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt. You see the same thing in verses 28 and 29. They yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. In other words, this false god of these people in Peor. And they ate sacrifices offered to the dead. They provoked the Lord to anger with their deeds. And the plague broke out among them. And then you see it again. If you look at verses 34 through 36. They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them. A little, little history. When God gave them into the promised land, he said, you've got to kill all those people. He doesn't tell Christians to do that. We don't have holy wars. 
It's one of the distinctives about Christianity versus Islam. But he told these people in this point in history, when you go into the promised land, kill everybody. Because if you don't, you will be snared, you will be trapped by their false worship, and you'll forget the steadfast love of God. And that's exactly what they did. They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord had commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. They served the, their idols, which became a snare to them. So the first and second commandments are already out the window. They can't get right when it comes to these two things. Over and over and over, if you were with us through the whole series of cover to cover through the Old Testament, every other chapter, they're bowing down to an idol. They're worshiping a false God. And then, the 10th commandment. Do you remember the 10th commandment? Anybody? Do not covet. Thank you. Pastor's wife better get it. (laughs) So, don't covet. Don't envy other people. Don't be jealous of other people. Broken. Look at verse 14. They had wanton cravings in the wilderness, and they put God to the test in the desert. Look at verse 16. It says, when the men in the camp were jealous of Moses and Aaron, the Holy One of the Lord. Jealousy, this wanton craving for what we don't have, is a direct violation of what God told them. This is how you're designed to operate. You're designed to operate not Jealous, not envious, not wishing you had what you don't have. They were discontent because they forgot the steadfast love of the Lord. If I remember the steadfast love of the Lord, then I really do know that this good God has given me everything I need and anything he's withholding from me at this moment is ultimately going to work out for my good. Now, sometimes he's withholding things from me, and it doesn't seem good at the time. I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying, according to the scriptures, everything that happens in our life will work out for good, even if it's not good. And if I can trust his steadfast love, then I can be content. And this is a big point that, that is made in the New Testament as well. If you, if you were to flip over, and, and I know it's... Uh, <laughs> Just listen, and I'll, I'll read you some, some scripture about contentment. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, I have learned in whatever situation, this is Paul talking, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I have learned that in whatever situation I am to be content. Now, Paul, when he's talking about this, he says, when I have nothing, I've learned to be content. When I have plenty, I've learned to be content. When people are are mocking me, I've learned to be content. When people are are giving me a pat on the back, I've learned to be content. Did you know the the verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who who strengthens me? You know that verse that we always see, like, you know, on sports stuff? Has nothing to do with sports. I mean, I'm sure if you can dunk a ball, it's because God's good. But it's talking about, in the context, it's talking about He will give you the ability to be content in all circumstances. That's what he gives us the ability to do. He gives us the ability to be content. If you, uh, if I, well, I'm going to turn over to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 10 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. It doesn't say the best food. It doesn't say the nicest clothing. If I have food and clothing, Paul says, I can be content. We can be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. I mean, that's a whole sermon on itself, right? Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. And you might say, well, I've never desired to be rich. I've just desired to be comfortable. If you're living as an American in America, you are rich compared to 98% of the world. We desire 
more than what we have. We are not content with what we have, and that causes all kinds of temptation. Into a snare, it says, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. You've seen people who have made a shipwreck of their life because they were just chasing the next dollar. Some of us in this room have been there. If I, if I can just get enough money for this. For me, it's never been money. It's just the stuff that money gets. If I could have that guitar, if I could have that car, if I could have... Anybody else? Being discontent causes us to be caught in a snare. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, same word that we have in Psalm 106, this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The problem is we forget. And it causes us to worship other gods. It causes us to worship other things. It causes us to be discontent. And the saddest one that I see here, and it's only because I'm a human, God would say the saddest one is we're not loving him. But this forgetfulness of God's steadfast love, it causes us to break the sixth commandment. Does anybody know the sixth commandment? Yeah, don't, don't kill somebody, right? Don't murder. All right, way to go, Lori. Way to go, Aunt May. Don't kill. Now, you would think this would be easy, especially our closest loved ones, the ones that we are tasked to care for. But look what this forgetfulness of God's steadfast love causes them to do. Turn to verse 36. We saw this, they served their idols, which became a snare to them. But look what this idol worship caused them to do. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons in verse 37. Verse 38, they poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. This is the end result of forgetting God's steadfast love. We are incapable of loving others if we don't understand how much we're loved by God. And you might say, we would never do this. If you know what this is referring to, they had this God called Molech, this false God, and the, the statue would have these hands that were heated so hot that they would put the babies onto the hands and their flesh would melt away. And they would do this because they wanted to appease this false God because they forgot that there's a God who loves them that wants to give them children, not take their children. They forget their steadfast love and they turn into this barbaric, monstrous race. And we are no different. Our country by the thousands, kills children. Not at the hands of Moloch, but to maybe get a little jump start on our career. We won't have that child. Maybe we'll just try to have kids later. Maybe because somebody is going to look bad at us because we have a, a child out of wedlock. I don't want to deal with that, so... The babies are killed. By the thousands, the babies are killed. Today. Today. This week. I, I can't even remember the number. I think it's upwards of 60 million in America since Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade was established. Because we forgot his steadfast love for us. And we forgot that we are called to love Others, especially the most vulnerable. This list goes on and on. I, I just tackled four of the commandments. 
But while we study Psalm 106, I'm just begging you, don't look at it as their problem back there in history. Don't look at it as the world around us, their problem. Oh, we would never do this and we'd never do that. All of us have a reflex, a tendency to drift away from God, to forget his steadfast love. None of us on our own drifts toward him. None of us. None of us on our own drifts toward him. And again, we could write a psalm about our personal Christian life time and time and time again that we turned away. But here's something I want you to think about as we dig in. And God wants you to remember your past. But he doesn't want you to be owned by your past. Amen? Does that make sense? The problem throughout human history is we forget our past. Or we just sugarcoat it and we we only remember the, the highlights. And so then we just repeat all the lowlights. But some of us, because of the sin that has been done to us or the sin that we have committed, and most times both, sometimes we are owned by our past. And we cannot live in the right now steadfast love of the Lord. We can't live in the promise of what's to come because we are so wrapped up in that. Isaiah 43 says, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. In other words, don't be owned by those things. But he does also say, God says in Deuteronomy 5, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. God doesn't contradict himself. He's saying there are nuances to our memory, right? Anybody who has been owned and has been freed from the slavery of their past can tell you, I never want to forget. But I don't live there anymore. I never want to forget what I allowed myself to do or allowed to have done to me. I never want to forget that even before I could do anything about it and things were done to me, I want to remember that so that I don't do it to the next generation. This this is the the life. We, we, We recognize the past but we're not enslaved. We're not chained to it anymore. Amen? This is what we see in this psalm, this psalm that is so full of problems that come from not remembering the steadfast love. It ends with a pardon, a pardon from God. And we receive this pardon because of his steadfast love, not ours. Uh, Go to 45 again. 45, it says, for their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Thank God he wasn't waiting for us to love him better. Thank God he wasn't waiting for us to finally get right. Thank God he wasn't waiting for us to finally just just get that perfect mix of, of humility and purity and love. He didn't wait because he knew he would wait forever. None of us can attain the steadfast love that unites us. And so it was his steadfast love that brought us pardon. It was him remembering his covenant. It's interesting that it says his covenant and not our covenant with him. If you don't remember the story, in in the very beginning of the Bible, this guy named Abram was given this covenant, and Abram did not really participate. He just watched God move between these sacrificed animals, where usually when people made a covenant, they would sacrifice these animals, and they'd walk together through the the path between them. And and, and that was basically them saying, "If, if I break my side of the covenant or you break your side of the covenant, let the same thing happen to you. Let you be butchered, cut down the middle. God had these sacrificed animals on either side and he put Abram in a trance to where he couldn't move and then he moved between them and he basically said, if I'm, if I'm counting on you to keep your end of the deal, this is all, not, none of it's going to work. And so I'm going to keep both sides of this. 
And we get hints of that in this psalm. See, there's two things to notice. There's, there's an already rescue in this psalm, and there's a not yet rescue in this psalm. So look what I mean. In verses 45 and 46, we already read 45, look at 46. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. At the end of this 800-year cycle of sin and stupidity, they're in bondage, they're in exile, and God puts it on the hearts of the people who are oppressing them to let them go back to, to Israel, right? You remember that part of the story? So there's this already part, he did rescue them, but if you look at verse 40, or 4, look at verse 4, it says, remember me, O Lord, when, this is talking future tense, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them. In verse 47, we're just skipping back and forth. It says, save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory and your praise. Again, this is future tense. Like, we're waiting for that rescue so that we can fully and finally give praise to your name. There's an already not yet aspect of this psalm that he is giving this pardon. He is rescuing us in the here and now. But there's something so much better coming. Does that make sense? There's something so much better coming. And listen, the amazing thing about this is he has to make a way for this to be possible. If you remember in verse 3, it talks about his righteousness and his perfection, right? Well, if God is perfect and righteous and we have sinned against him, what, what should we get because of our sin? Death and, hell. Death and hell. You should teach your kids. If your kids are at home, teach them. If your kids complain, I don't have this, I don't have that, you just ask them, what do you deserve? And teach them to say, I deserve death and hell. Okay, so, so dinner's fine then, right? That, that, that video game system's great compared to death and hell, right? Uh, so, so we deserve death and hell because of our sin. If God is just and is going to take care of sin, how in the world are we going to be pardoned? Because we're sinners, the way is, he gave us mediators. In the Old Testament, we see, in, in this psalm, we see two mediators that God gave to his people, that God raised up to rescue his people from their stupidity and sin. The first one is Moses in, in verses 23 and 24. It says, therefore, he said he would destroy them. This is when they made the calf. They made the, the, the golden image of the calf. He said, all right, I'm going to kill him. Moses, I'm going to start over with you. And he rose Moses up. He raised Moses up to be a mediator, to step in between the gap. And, and it says, Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. See, God raised Moses as a mediator who stood in the breach and Moses points us to a better mediator. Do you know who he is? Oh, you guys are really responsive today. Jesus, all right? Sunday school answer, if you never know, Jesus is the right answer. He rose, he raised Jesus up to be the perfect mediator. Moses was just a shadow of that. Jesus was the true and better Moses who advocated and interceded for his people before the cross, and right now, at the right hand of God, he is interceding for us even today. Remember before the cross, he looked out on the people who were crucifying him, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The true and better Moses stood in the breach between sinful humanity and perfect God so that wrath wouldn't touch us. And even now, he is interceding for us. Hebrews 7, 25 says that he, Jesus, is able to save us to the uttermost, save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, through Jesus, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The them are those who draw near to Jesus. He is right now interceding for you. Right now, interceding for you. When you sinned last... Might have been while you're in this room. 
Jesus is saying to the Father, I died for them. They're clean. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. We're clean. He's interceding. He's reminding the Father. In 1 John 2, 1, it says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He stands in the breach, but but there's another picture of Jesus in this psalm that if you miss it, you miss you miss the cross. Phineas. Now, when I said Phineas, some of you thought Phineas and Ferb, right? Can we just be honest? This Phineas is a different Phineas. It says here that Phineas stood up. This is when they yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. This is in verses 28 through 31. Phineas stood up and intervened, and the plague was stayed. This is from Numbers 25. And, and what happened is, is these, these other nations were influencing God's people, and the guys were getting together with the women of these false gods, and they were being just drug along into worship of these false gods. And one of the Israelites brought one of these women into his tent right across from the, 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 the tabernacle and he goes into his tent to be with this lady. All right? Everybody understand what we're saying? So Phineas gets up, leaves his friends, gets a spear and goes in and impales both of them through the belly and kills them. That's how he intervened to stop the plague. He interceded. He said something has to be done about this sin. The wages of sin is death. Death has to be poured out here. Jesus, the true and better Phineas, did not kill us for our sins, but he took the piercing upon himself. Do you remember the story when he's on the cross? They, they want to break the, the legs of the prisoners on the crosses so that they can get it over with. And they go to break his legs and they realize, oh, he's already dead. But then just to make sure, they jam a spear through his ribs into his heart and out flows blood and water. He is the true and better Phineas who took the piercing for us, for our sin, so that we could be made right with God. This psalm begins and ends with hallelujah. This song begins and ends with praise the Lord because his steadfast love endures forever and his steadfast love was most evident at the cross. Amen? Now, open up the little red book. I'm going to turn off my mic or take my mic off. Nobody wants to hear that. Open up to page 143. We don't have it on the screen because we don't have a screen. But these things, before they had screens, they, they just had the words in the, in the book. So, page 143. Once you're on page 143, everybody get your red book. Once you're on page 143, stand up. And, and we're all going to sing, all right? I'm not going to lead us. I'm just going to sing with y'all. Sing nice and loud. If you don't know the, the song, then, you know, just listen to the first verse and then keep up. This is a song that is reminding us of God's steadfast love. When you go from here and all the distractions start pouring in, remember all these crickety old voices, like mine and yours, singing this song and remember God's steadfast love for us. Amen? What wondrous love is this, oh my soul, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, oh my soul. What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. For my soul to bear the dreadful curse. For my 
my soul. Now, this next verse, it says when I, but we're a church. We're all in this together. So wherever it says I, say we. When we were sinking down, sinking down, sinking down. When we were sinking down, sinking down. When we were sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for our souls, for our souls. Christ laid aside his crown for our souls. To God and to the Lamb we will sing, we will sing. To God and to the Lamb, we will sing. To God and to the Lamb, who is the great I am. While millions join the theme, I will sing, we will sing. While millions join the theme, we will sing. Okay, remember this. And when from death we're free, we'll sing on, we'll sing on. And when from death we're free, we'll sing on. And when from death we're free, we'll sing and joyful be. And through eternity, we'll sing on. We'll sing on, and through eternity, we'll sing on forever. Thousands of years after we die, we will be face to face with God, and we will be singing praises to this holy Lord. Remember his steadfast love. Please don't cast it aside so you can think of the little stuff that gets in the way that takes your heart away from him. He loves you more than you know. He loves you more than you love yourself. Take that love and go love the people around you. Amen? Have a great week. I love you.